Hi everyone. Welcome to Wine Wednesday here at Rutherford Hill. It's great to be back with you today on this beautiful day um, on the hill here. It's been a beautiful early, early 90s here today on the hill and um, we thought today we would come down to our olive orchard here and, um, and to have a little tasting with you all today. So it's beautiful. I feel like I'm not at work, so it's just so nice and calm, and it's just it's amazing. And um, this is an often if if you've been to the winery, this is a place where um, private events can be down here. Um, there's often uh, proposals that happen down here. So if you're in the inkling to uh, propose to someone or maybe renew <laughs> renew a proposal, come on down here, or just come anyways and just come see us uh, as Napa is open, um, and we are also open. Um, we have, uh, you can, reservations only online. Uh, we have some beautiful outdoor tastings um, that we hope to see you at soon. So come see us. And um, today, um, if this is our third, for those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Marisa Taylor. I'm the winemaker at Rutherford Hill Winery. And today we are going to be tasting a Rutherford Cab from 2015. Um, this is the third week of our June virtual tastings. Um, I hope that for those of you that have joined us for the other two weeks, I hope you've been, been enjoying the Ian Tiago and the Sauvignon Blanc. And it's really fun today to taste the, to be talking about the Rutherford Cab as we are in Rutherford. So um, it is a Rutherford kind of day today. Uh, we have both of our wine and our food from Rutherford uh, restaurant and winery, obviously. So so today we have a pairing with, a, I believe it was a Hawaiian ribeye, and um, what, what a great combination for a cab, uh, especially a mountain cab that has a lot of tannin. It's a great uh, compliment, so we thought, why not? And we picked this beautiful uh, steak from ribeye from Rutherford Grill. So for those of you, uh, it's a very, it's a local, I'd say a popular local spot here. There's a lot of winemakers that uh, hang out there uh, for lunch and dinner, especially, you know, during harvest too, you just kind of pop in and, and meet up and eat at the bar, grab a bite to eat in between vineyard walks. So uh, it may have delicious food. So it's a great place to go. So if you're in the neighborhood or when you come to see us, pop up here for tasting and head down to the Rutherford Grill and have a steak or whatever you like. So, um, so thank you uh, to Rutherford Grill. And um, it's really great to see folks coming up to see us both here and then just seeing a little bit more buzz in the valley. Um, but yeah, it's just been really wonderful to see see your faces. So come see us while you can. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and start with our uh, the cab. Um, so as I mentioned, it's 2015. So I um, thought we'd kind of start ch chatting about that vintage. Um, we've talked before previous previous <laughs> tastings uh, about uh, our our drought years, our drier years that we've had in 2015 was, I believe, the fourth one we had. Uh, it was a warmer warmer year. Uh, we had 75% of our rainfall that year, so it was drier. And it was one of the record, if you look at the overall heat for the entire year, was a warmer year globally. Um, and we had a warmer, unseasonably, unseasonably warmer vin uh, winter. And, and early spring, which led us to have a early uh, bloom, and which led to early set. And then we had in the heat, in the, the height of that, we had this cooling trend. So it kind of was reverse. And so we had this cooling trend when we were having set. And so we ended up with a vintage that was known for uh, exceptional quality, but just low yield. And um, that, that was true for us as well. And it was one of those vintages that it came, it, because it was so warm and had the less fruit, it also, it, we began harvest almost a month early. So we, here on the hill, we started August 7th that year. And it, and we, it was fast and furious, but it, for us, because of locations of the different appellations that we, we uh, sourced from, it was a, we had a, we did have to wait a little bit longer and it kind of ended regular, but it did, it started early. It was warm. We had, because of the clusters, there was um, some unevenness. Not in all vineyards, because it depends on what varietal was in bloom when that when that cool wave hit. But we had some fruit that we that we purchased up in Atlas Peak, and it was so so wet up there. They had fog and all this good stuff. The fruit was just there was a lot of shatter, what we call shatter. So um, we did um, that vintage do 
a little bit more sorting. We do an optically sorting to help um, push out some more of the green materials so we don't end up with that in the fermenter or the barrels that we were doing. So um, it was, it was you know, every year is different, right? And every year uh, you have challenges and uh, it was just one of those years that we really had to be on it and make those decisions um, for the fruit. So, but it, the wines are delicious and um, it's really, really great to, to be revisiting it here today with you. So, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Rutherford. So this, this wine is, um, it's actually our, the Cabernet that's in this wine is all from our estate vineyard here at the winery. So we have a little six acre block up on the hill here, um, and it is west facing and uh, rocky, uh, volcanic, a little bit of loam there, and it actually gives us um, a lot of dust. Would you refer to, if you've heard the term Rutherford dust, there's dust on your boots when you go up there. <laughs> Uh, so, so it's, it's a beautiful vineyard and it has this great, um, there's a great intensity to the fruit, uh, that comes off of that vineyard and particularly you can really taste, uh, that concentration, I, I think in this wine and, uh, the tannin structure and we chose to, uh, I, well, we chose to blend it with some Malbec and also with some Merlot from Oakville and the Malbec was up from Atlas Peak. So. A lot of mountain fruit and just a little bit of the Oakville uh, Valley floor fruit. Uh, Rutherford as an appellation is warmer than both of those two, uh, Atlas Peak and, and Oakville. And we, last week we talked about St. Helena with the St. Helena uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And St. Helena is a little bit warmer than us, about five degrees on average warmer than Rutherford. Uh, Rutherford is known for um, Cabernet and um, I like to think of it as the birthplace of Cabernet in, in Napa Valley, and um, and so it's real. It's exciting to grow our own Cabernet here in the heart of, of Napa Valley. Yep. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. And one thing from earlier, I thought might be beneficial to explain is like. For anyone who might not know what optical sorting is, when you're talking about mm -hmm. harvest, um, and then maybe explaining shatter a little bit more. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so uh, I mentioned optically sorting. Uh, well, for, let's start with shatter first. Um, when the grape cluster is in bloom, so it's and and like I mentioned, the cool weather came through and it didn't set as well. It just means like when you look at a grape cluster, if you had your even your table grapes that you buy at the store. Just envision if you had a hundred berries on that cluster, uh, shatter would be that instead of the hundred that it, the average cluster would have, it would have more like anywhere from 20 to, in some cases it was really extreme, like 70% less fruit. So shatter is just like it's, it's um, just missing spots. So you'll often end up with a cluster that has fruit here, but nothing here, and it's just really spotty. So, um, so there's more green, you'll see more stems, um, on the cluster then you will the fruit sometimes uh, not always sometimes it's just a little bit a little bit of shatter is okay it, um, for ripening you know it's all about having uh, even ripening and so um, what we chose to do is with the optical sorter is with our vineyard company that manages our vineyards they have an optical sorter that we would set up and you would dump the fruit in there and it's it's really amazing it has they have eyes that <laughs> can see the fairies and the green matter in it they do puffs of air and it just pushes, pushes after it's crushed and it pushes what you don't want out. And so you can fine tune what you want to go into the barrel and what you would like to go away. So uh, that's just a, it's a tool that, uh, it's a great tool that to have is in this day and age for winemakers to help really um, with the craft of winemaking and the style of their wines. So, and for quality, overall quality. So. So that's what we, we do. We do that a little bit every every year, but that year was one of the years we really were mindful of, of, of making that choice to do that. So, uh, A question from Paul. Um, how many cases in production of this wine? How many cases? I will tell you. I will cheat and look <laughs> at my notes. I knew you were going to ask that question. Uh, we, we did, oh, a very small production for this wine. We did 264 cases. So uh, it's a really special wine, and we had we had some left, a little bit left, and we thought we would offer it for this tasting. So yeah, we just did a little bit for uh, for the wine club. 
And um, we, when we um, optically sorted this wine, we also did some a portion of it into barrels. I've, I have mentioned that before, but we've we um, started doing that where we pop off the heads of the barrels, new, new French oak barrels, and we, we were so optically sorting them directly into the barrel, and then we would pop the heads back on, and it just makes this little compact um, fermentation vessel, and it's really, it's really, it's amazing. I, I love it. It really gives this great extraction and um, this layering um, of the tannin of the oak with the tannins of the fruit, and it just really gives it this this, this heightened um, mouthfeel and um, more spices in there too, and it's just a wonderful tool. Tool, and I think it really complements our state fruit very very much. And that this one, I would say, I believe it's about thirty three percent barrel fermented, and then the rest of it we had fermented in a small uh, stainless steel vat that we have in the in the reserve room. So, and then we just blend, blended it together. Same with the, the Malbec that was blended into this. Um, we did that a little bit differently where we fermented it in, in the stainless steel tanks and then pressed it off and had it finish in a lot of new oak. So it gives you also that nice, the nuances of the oak um, with that as well. So I think it's just a great, it's just for winemakers, for me, for when I talk to friends, it's, it's wonderful when you can have all these different components to pull from um, to blend together to, to go after the wine that you're that you're wanting to create so so shall we taste mm -hmm. oh and then another thing I'll mention is the Rutherford well we'll talk about it when we smell it <laughs> the Rutherford dust um, I mentioned that when, when we walk in the vineyard uh, the Rutherford dust and if, if many of you were members of the Rutherford dust society and that's it's referred to the dirt in the Rutherford, um, but it's also um, a, char a characteristic that you can pick up in the wines, um, and that that's referred to as Rutherford dust as well. So it's kind of a play on words that, and you know, I some folks, I would say we refer to it as. You can get like this little bit of nuance of cocoa powder kind of in their in the aroma, and um, yeah. And in some and you can in some wines you can actually smell they smell kind of the aromas of the soil. Um, so let me know if you see any of that in the wine. I I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like cassis and I do get the cocoa for me, the cocoa and the aroma of this wine. There's a sweet cocoa to it, and also well, I'll taste it. I tasted it earlier. I was getting cheating there that way, but there's a great, you can smell all the the spices of the barrels in there with the wine. I think there's a lot of birds out tonight. So I, ho I hope you can hear them. They're beautiful. <laughs> I feel like whenever we come to do these tastings, it's like all nature comes out. So they're, it's wonderful. Um, so oh, maybe I'm going to go ahead and taste it yeah, first. Yeah. For, for me, I, I get a lot of like that initial kind of upfront of like blackberry and black cherry and there is that spicy, there's a coat, there's a cocoa coating I feel it on my tongue and then I, for me, there's a lot of, um, I get it like in, the, there's a long finish, um, a little bit of espresso finish for me on the back palate. Um, and a little bit, I do smell almost a little bit of sarsaparilla. Little hint of that too. So yeah, I think it smells great. I think it would be a great. It would taste really great with the steak. Um, but again, I think I think you can have this wine with so many different things. You could have it um, if you don't eat red meat. Uh, portobello mushroom would be really great. It's nice and meaty. It gives that same kind of texture. Um, various types of cheeses too. Different cheddars. Um, yeah, and I know um, we enjoy it sometimes with the with grilled lamb. So, yeah. Okay. Ready for a couple sure. questions? I have a couple questions. <laughs> okay. um, so Sharon says um, she's asking, doesn't each oak barrel provide a unique taste? How do you take take advantage of that in production, or or do we take advantage of? Do we take advantage? Um, that's a great question, 
Um, yes, uh, each barrel does em embark different um, different uh, flavor compounds and aromas, and that really, um, by taking advantage of it, we purchase from different coopers too. So just we do experiments, and um, but we also have um, I have like. I have favorites, right? We have favorite spices that we like with our fruit, and um, so we, I tend to have my go-tos that I that I use for certain wines, and then uh, we'll use other barrel coopers too to blend in. Also, another thing with barrels too is that it's also the, the year, like if the first year that you fill a barrel is the, the strongest, right? The strongest uh, extraction that you'll receive of the oak flavor, of the, of the aromas, and then you have those one year, two year filled barrels also that help are an important part of the winemaking uh, but it really it just brings a different subtlety to the wines and then that you bring them all together and the toast and the toast levels as well so yes the toast levels will change the flavor compound the flavor profiles that you get from the barrels and i tend to be more of a I, for the wines the barrels that i per, that we purchase for the winery um, tend to be medium plus well um, Megan says she loves the concentration on the wine. Um, is that because it was a small crop? Um, I do believe, yeah, the, 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 the vintage is known for that, that high quality, um, and the small, the small crop does lend to some more, um, intensity in the flavor, uh, of wine. So yes, I would say yes. Thank you for asking. Cool. Um, and then two off topic questions are off of um, smell the sarsaparilla sorry point. that just hit me in the face so. <laughs> no, um so jane whitehead said they already um drank the 2015 oh. um a little early and so now they're drinking the 2013 do you have any comparison oh, um, that's... off the top of your head well good on you uh <laughs> well how's the 2013 tasting i really like to know um the 2013 was also another um dry year so i would think it would be um there'd be a similarity between um, in the concentration and in the flavor of the wine. Uh, I got it. I'm trying to remember what we blended it with that year. It it may have a little bit of a maybe a bluer tint. I don't know if I had put Petit Verdot in there that year, but I think it'd be pretty similar. So uh, you'll have to let me know how that one's tasting and what you think of it compared to the 15. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think a good question. From Richard is what's the difference between the Rathford Hill label and the Trilado label he's drinking a 2013 um, from Trilado vineyards. Trilado. Yeah. Good question. Um, the Trilado label, um, di the different years, so the Trilados, um, the, the Trilados own Rutherford Hill Winery, so the Trilados purchased Rutherford Hill Winery in 1996 um, and we um, make, we made a wine uh, in, in honor of them and so th the difference between the Rutherford uh, Hill Rutherford cab and the excuse me I might sneeze and the Trilado I don't what it, sorry <laughs> bless you I don't want to spray everywhere um and the Rutherford and the Trilado okay <laughs> sorry the Rutherford Hill um basically we make them in the Rutherford um the Trilado Historically, when I've blended them and sit down to blend them, um, has a little bit more. It has. I tend to use Petit Verdot to blend with it. I don't know what it says on the label. I hope I'm. Uh, I know in the 15, the Trilado Rutherford is. Um, I did is 95% uh, hillside with 5% of Petit Verdot, and the Rutherford Hill chose to blend more Merlot and Malbec. So it's a different stylistically on on blending those two wines. In 13, uh, we off also had Rutherford uh, fruit. We weren't replanting our vineyard. It's almost behind me down in the valley. Uh, our vineyard on Me Lane. So uh, my guess is the Rutherford Hill that year would have had a little bit more of the Me Lane Rutherford cab. So it's, it would give it a different style. That way it would be a little bit more red fruit maybe. If I was to Rutherford Hill, Rutherford cab would be more red fruit and the Trilado would have a little bit more blue fruit and a little bit more tannin. Yes. Um, and everyone is loving the wine. Oh, great. Thank you. And lots of comments that this is the best view in the valley. Ah, uh, yes. It is nice. I mean, it is. It's beautiful. 
I mean, you have the good view, but I can, <laughs> I can imagine what it looks like. <laughs> it's really nice sitting here today because it was warm up there. I was worried, and then I walked down the hill, and it was gorgeous. Um, what else was I going to share with you? My little fun facts I had written down. Well, just if you, for those of you out there <clears throat> with uh, gross acreage for Rutherford, the Appalachian of Rutherford is 6840, so almost 7,000 acres in Rutherford, the Appalachian, and 4,300 are vineyard acres. So it kind of gives you a sense of uh, when you drive through the valley here and you ponder through Rutherford what you see there. Um, and the percentage of vineyard Cabernet is king here in Rutherford with almost 67% of those vineyards are all cab. So it's definitely a varietal favorite here in Rutherford, but Rutherford also is known for Cabernet Franc, uh, Merlot, um, a little bit of Salt Blanc, so yeah. Um, remind me, did you already share the temperature fun fact of the difference in? Yes, temperature fun fact. <laughs> That, okay. Yeah, that um, Rutherford is five degrees cooler than St. Helena. Um, yeah. Okay, so Wesley is asking, would you decant this? If so, for how long? Yes. Wesley, I would decant it. I think, uh, well, you don't have to. If you don't have a decanter, don't you don't have to worry about that. Um, but I, I do think if you decanted it maybe an hour before you were going to serve it, that would kind of help open it up a little bit even more. Um, and then give you time to evolve when you're enjoying it with food or with dinner, with food or not, or just sitting there drinking it. But uh, I would do at least an hour beforehand, before presenting it to someone. Mm -hmm. A question from Avery. At what point of year do you typically start harvest and kind of what does that entail? Are we doing anything to prepare now? Yeah. Uh, typically harvest uh, starts in the fall. Um, for us, it can be usually at the end of August or early September is when we start. We usually start with whites or a rosé that we make. Um, so for us, for the vintage 2015, starting early August was, was that was unreal to start that, that soon. Um, and then we are really, right now, we are in the process of, um, sorry about that folks, uh, we are in the process of gearing up for harvest right now. So. Um, in the sense that we are bottling our 2018 wine and gear, gearing up for ordering supplies uh, for harvest. Uh, that means yeast, um, all that good stuff for uh, processing the grapes and um, getting equipment cleaned and all that good stuff. So we're not quite to the equipment clean, but just gearing up for planning um, what's going to happen for harvest. And as we all know, this is a really, this is a new, it's a new first, right, to be in a pandemic and then to be focused on what are we going to do for harvest and all the what is to take in my, into account. Um, I think um, I was watching a video from our southern winemaking friends uh, giving us, you know, what they learned from the pandemic and wine, you know, during harvest. And I think one thing to remember is that, you know, being in winemaking, you have to be, there's a flexibility and you got to be fluid to make decisions quickly, right? And winemaking, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about it, right? The art and the science and Mother Nature, that's what you get every year. Um, and you have to, you need to make decisions and think on your feet. And we're really kind of pushed in this now with this pandemic to all those what ifs again. So, I mean, I think we're just, we're just gearing up the best we can and make the best decisions that you can and keep everyone safe. That's the most important part of it, the whole puzzle. Um, and, you know, I had I worked for a winemaker that said to me in my early days, he's like, you know, I was stressing, you know, you stress about things. And then he looked at me, he's like, in the end, it's, it's just wine. I know we don't want to hear that, but it is. I mean, it, it's a beautiful just, right? We love wine. I love winemaking, but it does help put it in perspective when we're, when we, when we need to make these decisions and to plan. And um, so for us utmost here at Rutherford Hill, we want our staff to be safe and healthy and for those coming on property as well. And um, so we're, we're making all those decisions, but at the same time, we've got a, the quality of the wine is also the highest important as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, Jane is asking, is, are, is there any more of the 2015 available since it was such limited production? There is a little bit left. So if you reach out to Wine Club or <laughs> Anna Wine Club, she'll be sure to hook you up. I think she's sitting on a couple cases. Oh, you can order it online. 
<laughs> I could order it online. Uh, yes. And so Michael is asking, um, are like the notes of the blends on the label so that customers can re um, refer you know refer to it later, no. like the breakdown? Or um, no, here let me look at my notes. I think it's eighty six percent cab. No, it's eighty six percent. I'll look at my notes. It's eighty six percent cabernet, seven percent merlot, seven percent malbec. So that's another thing to be a Rutherford. You know, we keep talking about the appellation. So Rutherford, to be a designated Rutherford wine, it needs to be at least 85% of the fruit needs to be from that appellation. So we did 86% from our hillside here and then chose to do blenders to kind of, to balance it out and go after that character we're after. So yeah, so 86 cab, 7 Merlot, 7 Malbec. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, Anna's saying that the, the tasting notes um, are in the email like leading up to it. Uh, did you catch the the, no, the notes were in the email? So go back and check your notes. The, the link the link opens up with the notes. Um, okay, so William has made the observation that the alcohol levels seem higher than they were a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. Do you have you know um, a hypothesis as to why? Well, the alcohols. Well, I think. Well, first of all, it was a warm vintage, so you're gonna have warm you're gonna have warm alcohols. So that's uh, unless you pick super early. Um, you will get, because of the heat, you'll get higher elevated alcohol. So, um, well, that opens up a whole nother can of worms of a discussion about alcohol levels. I think, you know, people talk about the environment, right? Think trends are going warmer. I also think it's, um, it's stylistically, it's, it's trends on the style of wines that you're making. Um, and, you know, there, and I think trends come back down too, that alcohol levels, I think you'll see, I've seen come down again mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just it's just a stylistic uh, decision and choice and um, some years it, you know it's like if it's balanced you know and the wine the grapes taste great and you know you're for me I, I don't worry so much about the alcohol level I'm after the balance and the you know the concentration and of the, of the wine overall mm -hmm. um. Victor has asked, is it too early to inquire as to whether we will have a mid or late summer series after the bonus week next week? Oh, um, well, stay tuned. <laughs> I, I don't know yet. I'm, I could see us still doing some of these. Um, so stay tuned. Next week we will, or watch your emails. We'll, we'll keep, post, keep you posted. Mm -hmm. the thing, we'll probably get in, a, I would think we would get in a couple more before harvest gets going. Um, so... Mm -hmm. um, Jane is asking, can you say again your favorite blending with both Cabs and Merlots? You mentioned both Petit Verdot and Malbec. Does this vary by year or more by personal style? Um, that's a good question, Jane. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think it's a bit of everything. So I think that for me, I really um, depends on, you know, like we talked about the two different types of Cabs. Like if you want to give it different characteristics, different style. Um, Petit Verdot, when I use Petit Verdot, has got more of that blue notes to it. You'll get often more of the floral blueberry notes, um, different concentration that way. So it brings out that, it kind of highlights, not brings it out, it highlights that component of the wine. And then for me, the Malbec and the Merlot, Merlot is great to fill in like, fill in the cracks of cab, right? It helps give it volume and, to, you know, helps fill in the, the tannin, right? It gives it more mouthfeel. Um, and Malbec for me is also, it has more of that boysenberry, you know, it's kind of in between, right? So it gives it more of a redder tone as, versus like the Petit Verdot that's blue. So I'm going around in this, but for me, I think it depends on the vintage too. I really truly think that, you know, there are some wines we make that are 100% cabs, you know, that there's different blends is that um, it really is a reflection of what the vintage gives you and, um, and kind of what you're after, what that wine needs to kind of pull it in to kind of complete it. That's kind of how I look at it. So, I mean, I have some faves. I mean, I, I do I am, I do love Malbec. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but I also love the other, I have the, love the other ones too. So it just depends. And Cab Franc too. We can't forget Cab Franc, but throw it in there too. So, yeah. Okay. So when can people see us again? Next well, week? next week, so when to see us again is the question. Next week, 
Uh, we will ha we have our bonus tasting. We'll be tasting the 2005, I believe, episode. Uh, same time next week here, maybe down here, uh, at Rutherford Hill. So we'll be tasting episode next week. Um, you can find the wines online, rutherfordhill.com or, um, yeah. And also the tastings, the other thing too, is if you've missed the other tastings and you want to still get the wines, um, they are available on the Facebook lot. You can find the videos there also on YouTube and I believe Instagram. We're starting to post them there too. So, um, you know, there's a library of tastings out there for you if, you, if you'd like to, to join me that way. And if people don't have the episode next week, should they still join in on the tasting? Sure. If you don't have the episode next week, still join us. Of course we want to see you. Okay. So anyways, thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying your, your Cabernet and whatever you made tonight to enjoy with it. And, um, until next time, cheers to you and your health.